Welcome um, to tonight's webinar on autism and suicide prevention. Um, this is a panel discussion presented by the Howard County Autism Society. I'm Melissa Rosenberg. I'm the director of HCAS, and we really appreciate you joining us this evening for this very important discussion. Um, I want to welcome tonight's uh, panelists here with us, um, Carly Ott, who's our moderator for the evening, um, Lisa Morgan from uh, Autism Society of Maine. Uh, we have Sam Branson with us and also Bridget Rankowski, and we welcome them and thank them so much for being here this evening. Um, we're gonna begin with Lisa. Uh, Lisa has a master's degree in the art of teaching in special education. She's a board certified autism specialist and the founder and co-chair of the Autism and Society Committee of the Association of Suicidology. Lisa has authored three books, Living Through Suicide Loss with an Autism Spectrum Disorder, Living with PTSD on the Autism Spectrum, and Spectrum, Women, Autism, and Parenting. Lisa is a peer reviewer of the journal Autism in Adulthood and has also had several research papers published. She's a member of the AASET Community Council and owns her own consulting business, Lisa Morgan Consulting. She resides in Kittery, Maine with her four children and I welcome you tonight, Lisa. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, welcome everybody. I'm going to start off uh, this evening by talking about um, autism and suicide. So what do we know about autism and suicide? We know suicide is a leading cause of premature death in autistic people. Autistic individuals are significantly more likely to think about attempt and die by suicide than the general population. There are, there's a research study out there that says the suicide rate is three times higher. There was an autism and suicide conference in Australia and um, it was in 2021 and their research showed the suicide rate being seven times higher than the general population. As well, autistic females are 13 times more likely to die by suicide than autistic males. So risk factors are um, things that are shown to increase the risk of suicide for everybody. So the risk factors in the general population are more common in autistic individuals. For example, social isolation, uh, we're more vul vulnerable to abuse, um, low mood or changes in mood, low self-esteem, alexithymia, which is the inability to understand or explain your emotions and rumination, which is thoughts that are kind of sticky and they are um, kind of like broken records and you just keep thinking them and thinking them and thinking them and thinking them. Um, but we also need to consider additional factors that may be more specific to autistic individuals. So autistic individuals do have unique risk factors of suicide um, and the ones I'm going to share tonight are the ones that are most researched and most supported. So co-occurring psychiatric conditions. There was a national study done in Denmark that showed 90% of the autistic individuals in the study had, who had attempted or died by suicide had a co-occurring psychiatric condition with the most common being anxiety and other affective disorders. Lack of social support, as well as unmet support needs. These I do together because they go along with, uh, you know, misunderstandings, um, social communication challenges, as well as the number of unmet support needs, which can be anything from housing to employment, to higher education, to relationships, um, access to mental or physical health care, um, daily living skills, executive functioning. I mean, it can be a number of unmet support needs. And that is um, 
research has shown that to be a unique risk factor. Camouflaging or masking, which is a unique risk factor of suicide in that, um, well, first it's a social strategy to fit in. So, you know, masking works and helps autistic people to have a relationship, have a friendship, have a job, go to school. But research has shown it also has a negative effect on our mental health and is a risk factor of suicide. It's exhausting. So just the effort of um, suppressing all the sensory stimulation in your environment, suppressing your autistic traits, standing, talking, um, interacting in a way that is not um, inherently normal or feels right and keeping that up for a long time. So you can fit in, but it is, a, um, it is exhausting and a unique risk factor. Um, late diagnosis is a unique risk factor because of all the things above it in the list here. Um, lots of autistic people diagnosed later in life have many, many um, you know, experiences of trauma with social situations, um, rejection, fitting in, just being who they are in today's society and environment. Female, same thing, all of the above, um, plus, you know, going through having to be, um, having the experience of having been misdiagnosed, um, not believed, invalidated. Um, so being female on the spectrum is also a unique risk factor. As well as autism burnout, which is not depression, um, it is the demands of life chronically exceeding the ability to cope with those demands. And it can last three months or more. It, it's um, a regression of skills, loss of function, reduced tolerance to stimuli. Um, and it also has been shown to be a unique risk factor of suicide for autistic people. So warning signs are um, a more immediate risk of suicidal thoughts, uh, behaviors. There's less research in the autism field on warning signs compared to risk factors. But one thing that's really, really important to know, and if you come away with anything tonight, I wish it was this, that autistic distress and crisis may not, does not look the same as non-autistic distress or crisis. I'm gonna share some resources that are available. Um, the, this one, Autism Warning Signs of Suicide Considerations for the Autism Community, developed by the Autism um, and Suicide Committee of the American Association of Suicidology, can be found on their website, can be found on my website, free downloadable um, resource. And the reason why we made this resource is to first understand the need for considerations when assessing and supporting autistic people using the warning signs of suicide for the general public, then to recognize the differences and then to support autistic people as autistic people. These are the warning signs of suicide for the general population. I took it off of the, I took this list off of the A, uh, American Asso Association of Suicidology website. Um, and I'm going to go through a few of them tonight and show the considerations that I'm talking about that are in this resource. But first, I just wanna make sure that um, there are no important life altering decisions made based on the information in the following slides or in the resource. All the warning signs um, for the general public still pertain to autistic people um, with considerations about autism. The information here is to broaden existing knowledge about autistic people and to really remember that autistic people know the most about themselves and what they need, even in a crisis. Um, the job for pro professionals helping and supporting is to really make space for them to communicate what they need. So the first one that I'm gonna talk about is no reason for living, no sense of purpose in life. These statements for an autistic person could just be the reality of being an autistic person in our society who has no sense of cultural or social belonging and has never experienced that or has trouble experiencing that. 
So they may say, I don't belong to this world. I never, I'll never fit into this world. You know, I wish I were anywhere but here. You know, statements like that, it needs to be investigated on whether they are suicidal and have suicidal attempt um, intent, but it also needs to be investigated on whether they're just being truthful. And so, you know, communicating with them in a way they understand, which I talk about um, in one of the other resources, but pretty much it's, you know, concise, straightforward, getting right to the point, um, few words as possible. And, in, and what we wanna do is we want to st stop um, an autistic person who is simply being autistic from um, somebody thinking they're suicidal or an autistic person who's, who is suicidal um, having somebody just think they're being autistic. You know, we wanna get, get down to what's really happening for the autistic person that needs support. Feeling trapped is another, it's a, another warning sign for the general public. Um, autistic people can have, you know, some cognitive inflexibility, narrowing their options and may feel that they are stuck being autistic or being in a society that doesn't, is it made for autistic people or they could be, you know, ruminating in a negative thought pattern. Also, a crisis can cause regression of skills, um, one of them being problem solving, or diminish an autistic person's ability to regulate their emotions or manage their sensory difficulties, and they could feel trapped. The, the thing, the real supportive um, action to take is to find out exactly what is going on with the autistic person. So withdrawal is a warning sign of suicide for the general public, and it's a coping mechanism or self-care for autistic people. It can also be a warning sign for autistic people. So, you know, again, finding what's going on, um, changes in withdrawal patterns and behavior can be concerning. Um, research has shown a change in withdrawal coupled with a reduced interest in a special passion it can be is a warning sign of suicide for autistic people. Um, but again, you know, really this whole resource is really about finding out what's truly going on for the autistic person. Some other considerations to take are that the thinking process of autistic people can be very literal. So asking exactly what you want to find out is going to be very important. So for example, if you're trying to find out if someone is going to harm themselves or has any kind of suicidal intent and you say, do you want to hurt yourself? And the answer that the person gives you back is no, but they're planning to, they have a plan to, because you, because what, what needed to be asked was, are you going to hurt yourself? You know, are you going to kill yourself? So they may not want to, but they're going to answer. If that's what's asked of them, they're going to answer, no, I don't want to. And they may not elaborate um, in a crisis processing speed, you know, can slow down. It's negatively correlated to anxiety. So the higher the anxiety, the slower the processing speed. There could be a lot of internal, you know, regulating or trying to regulate going on. And they may just answer the question asked. So it's really important to ask what you want the answer um, you know, ask about the information that you truly want to have um, using concise, specific language. And then um, again, you know, using few words as possible, getting straight to the point um, and remembering that they do think very literally. So this resource, Warning Signs of Suicide for Autistic People, is a proposed set of warning signs for autistic people specifically. And it's really contingent on a change of behavior. And we, we also found through research that more than one warning sign can be um, found in a person at the same time who is in, you know, at, at imminent risk of, of suicide. I asked an international team of subject matter experts to develop this resource with me. And this is our team. And there are differences. We have um, different roles. So we have autistic people, we have 
people with lived experience of suicide, lived experience of suicide loss. We have researchers, practitioners, and autistic people. And really the purpose is to enhance the, the discussion about suicide risk with autistic people. It is again, not a substitute for professional support or risk assessment. The goal is to improve the understanding about the signs of imminent suicidal behavior in autistic people because the warning signs of the general public do not meet the unique needs of autistic people. So the structure of the resource is there are 10 warning signs, scenarios or case examples to go with each warning sign, emerging research, research findings, additional resources, and then a one page summary to use in real time. I'm gonna go through them, um, but I don't have time to get into them in detail or the scenarios, but again, they're on my website. Uh, I believe they're on the AAS website um, for a free downloadable um, resource to, for anyone to use. So the first warning sign of suicide for autistic people is sudden or increased withdrawal. So the difference here is it's not withdrawal, it's sudden or increased withdrawal. No words to communicate acute distress. This is probably the most tricky part of supporting an autistic person in crisis is they can look perfectly fine because everything kind of is going on on the inside or they're masking and they can look calm and they can look fine. And then they also may lose the words to communicate and they may not verbally be able to tell anybody what's happening. And so this is a real tricky one. Current traumatic event marked increase in rate or, and or severity of self-harm. So again, notice it's not self-harm, it's an increase in rate or severity. Worsening of anxiety or depression. A new focus on death-related topics that are not a special interest because autistic people can have suicide as a special interest. Um, suicide, suicide of singers or actors or just suicide in itself um, can be a special interest. The difference here, and you know, again, like with that other resource, really investigating to find out what's going on for this person is gonna be really important and supportive. Um, uh, a special interest could possibly turn into suicidal ideation, which could turn into suicidal thoughts and intent. So, you know, really keeping, in, keeping, um, up with what the person is experiencing. But if it's a special interest, they're going to feel good about finding out about suicide. And I mean, it's just going to bring them a feeling of interest, which is why it's their special interest. It's not gonna be a terrible thing for them. So, but still it's, it's, it's another tricky one. Perceptive suicidal thoughts and ruminations. Um, these are really difficult to get out of if somebody is ruminating or perseverating on a negative experience or a negative um, social situation that happened for them. And, you know, one possibility is to get them talking about their special interests or special passion. And again, using words that will help them to be able to communicate that to you. So instead of saying, what's, you know, what do you like doing? Well, they may like doing you know, many things, but what you really want to get is, you know, what is their special passion? So what is the one thing you love doing? Or, you know, what do you love talking about? And may, you know, key them into being able to share that and possibly stop the rumination enough for them to be able to regulate. Um, seeking means or making plans for suicidal for suicide or suicidal rehearsal. Statements about no reason for living or no sense of purpose in life and hopelessness. Hopelessness is the only one here that is the same as the warning signs of the general public. Here's another resource, uh, Crisis Supports for the Autism Community, a toolkit. This was written in, back in 2018. It was the first resource from the Autism and Suicide Committee of AAS. And it was first made for crisis center workers to identify and support autistic callers or texters. 
And at the time, there were no published studies on suicide interventions for autistic individuals. There were no consensus. There's no consensus on clinical guidelines. Um, we kind of knew that effective strategies had to consider going beyond the autistic individual. So at that autism and con autism and suicide conference in Australia, which was the first one just dedicated to autism and suicide in the world, um, I was invited to be a guest speaker. And this is one of the things that I said, which was actually included in the policy brief. Understanding autism and the culture of autistic people, so autistic people do not have to mask or camouflage their autism is suicide prevention. And the, the crisis support for the autism community toolkit can be found again on my website or AAS's website. And the purpose of the toolkit is to help crisis center workers and helpers to identify and support autistic callers and texters who are in crisis. And what it contains is it shows unique differences in communication, thought processes, um, sensory issues, and misunderstandings a crisis worker or other helper may encounter while assisting autistic people in crisis. This has been released to over 200 crisis, center, crisis centers in the US. And also it's gone beyond that to be used by professionals, family and friends, anyone who needs to support or communicate with an autistic person. Um, so one of the things it does is identify maybe someone doesn't know they're autistic and they call in, or maybe somebody um, doesn't disclose their autism. And in order to support them in the way that would be most helpful, they have to be um, you know, identified as autistic or at least, um, you know, at least be aware of some of the things that could um, be identifying. So it, they could express difficulties with sensory issues. That's an identifying factor. May present with opposite emotions. Um, they may be, you know, just in crisis and, and have no emotions, no tears, no emotions. Um, difficulty identifying or verbalizing their emotions, which could also be alexithymia, which research has shown that 50% of autistic people have alexithymia, but even if they don't, autistic people tend to have difficulty understanding their emotions. Um, may not know how to cope with or what to do with the emotions. So these are all identifying factors for crisis center workers to understand they may have an autistic caller or texter on the line. Um, may express difficulty or um, inability to make friends or sustain relationships. And then may use echolalia, which is the repeating of words, sounds, and, and phrases or responses. And this is tends to be an enjoyable thing for autistic people. So it may be indicated that they're coming out of a crisis as well. Um, it also could you know, be kind of tricky because to the crisis center worker, if they're on the phone, it could look like someone's mimicking them, but they're really not, they're really just, it, it could be echolalia. So to support callers and texters, definitely ask clear, direct questions using few words as possible, getting straight to the point, almost to the point where you feel like you might be being rude, but the honesty is very supportive for autistic people. Um, allowing extra time to process thoughts and formulate words. So on a crisis line and they, you know, the autistic person may be taking time to process words, but checking in and saying, hey, do you still want to talk is supportive. Um, and so you don't hang up on someone who's just trying to process and they're not done the call. They're just trying to process um, and then helping shift the thoughts. And I already talked about that, talking about any special interests they may have could possibly help them to shift the thoughts. So avoid using metaphors, um, social nuances or slang, any figurative language, um, you know, avoiding that would be supportive. Instead, speaking words of logic, so facts, um, and not, you know, are you frightened? Are you scared? I, you know, just kind of stay away from those emotional words because it is difficult for autistic people, especially everything can be more difficult if they're in a crisis. Um, also explaining positive coping skills. So take a walk, listen to music, um, you know, watch it, your favorite Netflix show or something. But in order to understand why, because a lot of autistic persons, people shared, they thought they were being dismissed and not helped until they were explained what the positing, positive coping skills were used for and how that would help them. So explaining the reasoning behind 
coping skills that you suggest would be supportive. And then when ending the call or text, if necessarily uh, facilitating a safety plan, um, you wanna encourage them to write down everything, of course, because high anxiety, um, disassociation could be going on and you definitely wanna get everything written down. Um, if they're not connected to resources, you might wanna help them connect to at least one um, community service or person that they feel comfortable with or safe with. And again, you wanna discuss and, and even practice how to do that, that's a social skill. And if they're diagnosed later in life or you know, maybe even not later in life and they may, they've never done that before, they may have to know what to ask, what information to disclose, what information to retain and remember, like what are you, what are you looking for? Um, and practicing with them would be very supportive. So in conclusion, um, Increase awareness that autism is a risk factor of suicide, um, suicidal thoughts and behaviors. I have heard from so many, um, you know, clinicians and professionals that they see an autistic person and they don't even assess them for suicide because they're autistic and they don't understand that it's the suicide rate is high for autistic people. Remember that autistic distress may not look like neurotypical distress. Autistic people can look fine, perfectly fine, calm, and be in a crisis. So their words have to weigh as much as if they are visibly crying in distress. You know, if they, if an autistic person in a calm state says, I'm thinking about killing myself, or I'm going to kill myself, or I'm going to harm myself, those words have to have as much weight as if they are extremely upset. Um, again, say what you mean, mean what you say, clear, direct, concise few words as possible. And then also make use of the growing number of autism specific crisis resources would be very supportive. And um, if there's anybody that has any questions, I, I can take a few and I think that we're gonna move on as well. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I know Alan put something in the chat about employment situations, um, also leading, um, connecting to feelings of hopelessness. Bridget, thank you for um, um, responding to Alan on that. It's, it's, it certainly is another um, thing that can contribute to su suicidal um, ideation. So um, anybody yes. else, any questions? And then we can, um, we'll go to the, to the panel. I don't see anything else. Yeah, so unemployment would be one of those unmet support needs, definitely. Sure. Yep, and we have a very, very high unemployment rates. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, Do you want me to stop sharing? Sure, thank you, Lisa. We'll move on to just one, oops. One more, I thought, I think you, I think you did put it in the chat and then yep. I am done, <laughs> thank and you. Just to remind everybody, we are recording tonight. It'll be posted. We'll share the slides and also the um, the link to the toolkit and Lisa's website with you as well. Uh, Eileen is asking, how can you find healthcare workers trained to deal with autistic people? That is a very good question. Um, they are few and far in between. And even if, I do want to say that if somebody says that they are, you know, can work with autistic people or experience to work with autistic people, I would ask some more questions about that as well, because people can just be ticking off the box and saying, yes, I, I work with autistic people because they met one or something. Um, I would definitely find out more. I'll also add quickly that I'm part of uh, the same uh, organization as Lisa with <clears throat> uh, Asset, and we're working on a five-year we got granted to do a five-year program on uh, suicide prevention in autistic youth, and it's defined up to age 23. So we are, it's in progress. Uh, it's going to be a couple of years, but we are creating resources so that care professionals, medical professionals will know and be trained in how to diagnose and identify. That is great to hear and is so needed. I know when we get calls to the office, there's just very few places we can send folks. 
Um, thank you. And I do that. think a lot of the suicide um, support is going to come from autistic people themselves who, you know, safety plans are going to be really important, especially geared towards autistic people, because the ones for non-autistic people are just they're, um, you know, they have lines for how many people you can call and autistic people may not have anyone to call, but they may have other coping skills that they can put into place and get them through that like wave of um, suicidal ideation or thoughts or behaviors that they need to get themselves through and, and be safe again. So a lot of it's going to, you know, come on to the autistic people themselves, I think. Thank you. Okay, um, I'd like to introduce now, uh, our two panelists and then our moderator. Uh, Bridget Rankowski is currently finishing up her master's degree in developmental disabilities with an emphasis in leadership and advocacy from Nova Southeastern University. She's an international presenter on autism, a published author and instructor for the Autism Speaks Transitions online course, and an in-home support worker. As a self-advocate, she spends spreads the message of positivity and autism acceptance to everyone she meets. In her other life, she's a fire spinner. I love this. <laughs> in the award-winning vaudeville troupe, Dark Follies. Bridget resides in Maine. Um, Sam Branson is an autistic self-advocate and the parent of an autistic child. His PhD was in physics and after finishing his PhD, became fascinated by autism research and switched fields so that he could focus on autism research and advocacy full time. He's currently working for Duke Autism Center with research interests in healthcare access and mental health in autistic individuals. He is especially interested in how the newer diversity movement can better support all autistic individuals, especially those who are multiply marginalized or who have higher support needs. So welcome, Sam. And, um, also, our moderator for this evening is Carly Ott. Uh, she's an autistic self-advocate, a mother, and VP at a Fortune Top 50 company. She's a member of the Autism Society of America's Board of Directors and chairs its Council of Autistic Advisors. Carly volunteers her time for multiple autism nonprofits, helping women connect with autism resources and improving employment outcomes for autistic people. She also advocates for greater inclusion at museums, zoos, and aquariums, and is a winner of numerous awards, celebrating her mentorship, as well as her leadership in global diversity and inclusion efforts. So thank you all. It's very impressive. Carly? Yeah. You know thank you, Melissa. And, and thank you for asking, you know, to have a presentation on such an important topic. Um, you know, it. I had a lot of folks raise their hand to say that they wanted to to be involved and um cuz this is something that that really hits home for a lot of us. I um I personally was suicidal when I was in junior high. I didn't get my diagnosis until I was 28. And um by the time I was in 7th grade, uh, I'd experienced years and years of bullying, years of misunderstandings, miscommunications not understanding why I couldn't understand how to get along with people. And um, my, my parents recognized that something was wrong and they took me to the local mental health, um, you know, nonprofit that runs all the no mental health programs in my area. And they did a per perfunctory evaluation of, of me and uh said that I needed to stop blaming my parents for everything and get over it. And, and that nonprofit's still around today. And, you know, they're doing much better. My mother ended up joining their board of directors and helping them reform their ways over the years. But I will say the one thing that, that made me, that stopped me from trying to kill myself was the realization that I would then be living, leaving my sister behind. I have a younger sister and that then she would have to face the world alone and that she wouldn't have anybody by her side to help her get through her um, challenges in life. Cause she'd had a, a year where she had to be homeschooled because of an, of a, of a, 
it was actually mono that just wouldn't go away. And, um, but when she tried to go back to school, then the next year, you know, she had a lot of social problems of her own that I could really relate to. And she ended up with pretty bad depression herself. So, um, you know, betwixt the two of us, you know, we just, we kind of, even though we had, you know, the normal sister contentions on normal sibling issues, we also made a pact with each other to always be there for each other. And, you know, even as we got older, you know, we're allowed to call each other 24 seven, you know, no matter what. And, um, and so there's, you know, been times where she's called me in the middle of the night and I've called her in the middle of the night and just having that agreement that it's okay and that we're not going to be violating any social rules or social norms is huge. And, um, it got me, I, you know, ended up in autistic burnout before I had my diagnosis and ended up on SSDI for a number of years. And even with that, I was not suicidal because of that pact with my sister and I, but I have lost people. I've lost friends and it is the type of thing where you oftentimes, um, you know, just as it is with the, the typical population, you still wonder if it's your fault and you still wonder if there's something you could do. We just may express it differently. And um, so I personally just like to keep in mind that um, no matter what I'm going through, I would put the people that care about me through an eternity of, of pain if I do, if I were to have done something. So with that, I really want to, um, you know, ask, you know, Bridget and, and Sam and, and even Lisa, if you want to chime in, you know, what, what is it that makes you passionate about, you know, about suicide and autism? Like, why did you raise your hand and say, yes, I want to, to be here today? You know, as much as you're, you're willing to share. Uh, Sam, do you want to kick it off? <laughs> sure. <Thank> you. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to be all like, hi, I'm going to volunteer you. No, you, you can. Um, yeah, I guess I have a couple different things that led me to become passionate about this topic. Um, I think the first one was uh, when, when my child was born, we realized pretty quickly that he was probably autistic. I think we had a pretty good idea when he was around six months old and then he had his formal evaluation when he was 18 months old. And, um, you know, as with any parent, you just want your child to be supported, you know, be supported, to be loved, to, you know, have a good quality of life ahead of them. And so I went down quite a Google rabbit hole at that time, trying to learn everything I could from uh, other autistic people. I mean, I'm autistic myself, but I'm just one person. So I wanted to hear a lot of people's perspectives on how their lives were going, what was going well for them, what was challenges. And I ended up coming across all sorts of research articles discussing, you know, the, the pain of masking, um, the really low life expectancy in autistic individuals, the, the trauma that so many autistic people go through and how that can relate to co-occurring conditions. I guess all of the things that Lisa just went over in the presentation and it's just I guess this sounds very simplistic, but it was just so sad. You know, I had this precious child who's wonderful and I'm the absolute best for him. And, you know, he has a good life. He's very old. He's quite carefree. Um, but just thinking of, you know, how much I want to protect him and give him a good life and also how much I want that for everyone else, like all the other autistic people as well. Um, and, you know, just seeing how many autistic friends of mine struggle with this topic. Um, uh, just how many people with great value, I think, aren't always able to see the value they have to offer the world because it's been instilled in them from so young that, that they're wrong, that they're broken, that they need to be fixed or that they need to change themselves. And so I guess one thing that I've been really interested in, um, you know, both as, as a parent and a friend and also someone who facilitates some discussion or support groups is how can we um, sort of help prevent people from getting to the point where they feel like this is an option they need to take. Um, can we help support people in you know, developing a good quality of life um, so that hopefully these crises supports are never something that they have to need. Um, and then I guess personally, I've found 
Uh, and I guess a lot of this also is covered in Lisa's presentation, but just how challenging therapy can be, um, even with really caring and well-intentioned therapists. I think a lot of it was, uh, as was discussed before, being in, if, if I were to be really anxious or really sad, I don't think I communicate that very typically. Uh, you know, I would probably just seem like I'm having a regular conversation, especially if the therapist is asking something that's just a regular question. I'll do my best to answer the question. And even if I'm really sad inside, if that's not what they asked, I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> spit that out. Um, and so I think that's certainly led to some, uh, you know, miscalibration of, of how I'm doing and also some questions that might be more um, indirect proxies that might work for, for typical people. Like someone might ask, right, do you feel hope? I think, yeah, I mean, I feel some hope, but there's things that make me concerned about the world, but I feel there's some positives in the world and that would be true whether or not I'm here or not. <laughs> like I'm, the world doesn't revolve around me and so I say, yes, yeah, I feel hopeful about this and that and then they'd be like, oh, great, you know, you're super hopeful. And that's true, but that doesn't mean that I'm not struggling inside. So I think a lot of it was that um, celebration. Um, and then on the flip side of that, I've also found that there have been kind of some cool parts about being autistic as well. And I, I think this is something I'm interested in learning more about, but I feel like uh, just as we have unique risk factors, I feel like we maybe have some unique things that can be good supports for us. I found a lot of supports in the autistic community. Uh, you know, as Lisa mentioned, special interests can, just as I can ruminate on negative things, uh, ruminating on special interests can be so wonderful. And, you know, sensory uh, repetitive movements, I know they can be stigmatized, but they can be a really great source of relaxing. And so I guess I'm here kind of to share a little bit of my own experience, but I'm also just interested in learning more about the topic and how it applies to people with all different types of experiences and support. Uh, <clears throat> hi, I'm Bridget. Uh, I'll keep it succinct because there's like a lot of answers. Uh, I can first identify being suicidal in the fifth grade. Um, a lot of my autism connects to trauma. And as Lisa talked about in the slides, trauma, uh, not just physical, emotional, verbal, but also sensory trauma can have a huge impact on an autistic person. And I grew up in a domestic violence household. Um, I also identify as non-binary because too much gender for just one category uh and being raised femme uh female the social dynamics of it when you're autistic it's a whole nother ball game like there's entire magazines devoted to trying to teach you how to be like social uh you can pick up masking from any drugstore of how to do your hair how to talk and for me that masking took a huge toll on me and I'm 33 years old. It really wasn't until the pandemic that I feel like I kind of fully hit the, the wall of like, choose, choose your autistic burnout style. Uh, do you cut your hair? Do you dye it? Do you get the full tattoos? And as everyone knows, the salons and tattoo parlors were closed. So hence the hair, but being, more authentically myself, uh, not apologizing for the supports I need, sensory, emotional, um, learning what it is that I need in order to be best supported for myself and therefore being able to communicate that to other people so that people don't have to walk the same difficult path that I've walked to figure out like, yo, weighted blanket, yo, choose your fidget toy, uh, whatever makes you feel good. and it has a ripple effect because as Lisa said, which I firmly believe, which is part of the reason why, again, thank you so much, Howard County Autism Society for having this panel because us as autistic people, we have the answers. We just need maybe the tools, uh, the language, uh, the support. We need the platform in order to broadcast what it is that we need in order to feel comfortable, confident, and reduce uh, suicidality because a lot of us feel like we just don't have a place or we don't fit in. 
and we feel like it's something inherently wrong with us. If we look at a lot of the symptoms um, uh, that Lisa had mentioned, especially with the comments that Alan has mentioned in the chat of employment, a lot of the autistic signs are internalized, uh, not highly visible. Uh, especially compared to the standard suicidality warning signs, which are, you know, giving away objects, all that, like we know that. Ours are different. Um, and we've lived through it. We've had peers live through it and we're able to communicate what it is that we needed. And I'm very thankful that we're, I'm part of a five-year study that uh, we're going to be working with clinicians. We're going to be working uh with young adults on the spectrum and changing stuff that doesn't work for us like that whole the standard crisis plan my crisis plan looks completely different than that because i'm not going to call crisis if i'm in a crisis if i call crisis i just get frustrated which does deactivate me but it doesn't solve my problem it goes to a different category of like i'm frustrated now um but yeah, that's the long and short and succinct of why I'm here and why I'm involved with this. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And and I will say, too, that, um, you know, I want to thank Lisa and, and Bridget, too. I believe you've contributed because at Autism Society of America, we have had a suicide task force that I initiated a um, in the summer of 2021, where we've had a group of, of self-advocates and professionals really trying to drill into it and and, and make things better uh, when it comes to the experience of things like calling the suicide hotline. We now have the 988 um, national hotline. And we had so many reports prior to the task force formation on, you know, people calling the hotline and being worse off afterwards, as Lisa alluded to a bit in her her slides. And I I understand that because even when it comes to just general coaching, you know, I I give advice to to managers to say, you know, ahead of time, before you need to coach someone, have like a code word that you can use to, to take someone out of the moment to say, hey, we're going to have this, you know, we, let's have a, a conversation. So it could be like, all right, everybody, let's head to the circus now and talk about job skills, you know, whatever, something silly that's going to make you laugh if that works for you, or, you know, uh, you know, just whatever works for the person, you know, have a way to be able to take them out of the moment and have that conversation because sometimes even the, like a little bit of criticism will start that ruminating. And if you have enough of that coming at you, um, you know, even just that in and of itself can make you feel worthless because you don't forget about those little things like, ah, my my executive said this about me. My mom said that about me. My next door neighbor keeps yelling about this or that or the other thing. You know, it all piles up. It all builds up. And we don't necessarily tell people, you know. And so, you know, I think that there's just so much good work going on here. And Sam's recently joined our Council of Autistic Advisors as well. So I'm um, excited to have that ongoing um Feel, you know, send us research every day. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I, I want to transition now to ask, um, you know, what do you know, like, like from your personal experience? Because again, like Lisa said, you know, things are different for everybody. And what our ideas that we have here and the things that we share here may or may not work for people, but hopefully it'll, it'll be a start and it, or it could make you think of other things that would work for the person in your life. But for those that have friends or family who are autistic, who, um, who do seem to be going down the path towards suicide, um, what tips or recommendations, um, you know, do do you have um you know Bridget and Sam for for them to approach uh the person that they care about first off uh i i always think by like make sure that the biomedical needs are being met um 
for me, when I'm in pain, like really bad pain or sick, uh, like I think that everyone hates me. Like when I, I'm, I'm coming in from my bed right now because I got COVID last week. And as soon as I tested positive, my fiance said, we know how you react when you're sick. So how often do I have to text you that I love you so that like you remember it? Um, because when we're in pain, like story follows state, like there's science behind uh, us thinking in the negative, like us that hopelessness is directly connected to pain. So make sure that first off, if someone is feeling like, and you think that they're going on this path, um, make sure that there's nothing medically wrong. Like we also sometimes don't have in, uh, interception, body awareness. Yeah, I'm 33 years old. It took the first 28 years of my life to realize that not everyone wakes up in pain every day. Like I have a uh, connective tissue disorder. The uh, connection between Ehlers-Danlos and autism is a whole thing, as well as uh, reproductive health issues for uterus owning autistic people. Uh, like there, whole lot of endometriosis. There's a lot of biomedical that goes along with autism. So first and foremost, make sure that those needs are being addressed. Um, I also, from a, a family friend perspective too, make sure that you're being supported and that you also have emotional support because there may be some heavy conversations coming up. Uh, it, it's not easy. Like it's a, it's a, it's difficult. It's emotional work uh, when you are engaging in these conversations, taking the phone calls at night, especially if you're working, taking care of kids, taking care of yourself. So I always think that expanding the community network and support is really familiar. Uh, thank you for chiming in with uh, introception. Uh, <laughs> one of our many senses but i think i'd start off with those as like the first steps um of again checking on biomedical needs and if you're going to be engaging in this conversation make sure that you yourself have some type of support uh while you're going through this i think that i think it's a little bit related to that and also related to what you mentioned earlier Carly, is um I find that social expectations can be a little bit unclear, at least for me. And so um, personally, I have a lot of fear of uh, bothering other people just in general. Um, and some of that's good. I mean, I think it's good to not want to be a bother to other people, but sometimes it, I can take it a little bit over the top, uh, where even if someone will be very happy to listen, or even if they have a very good relationship, I'd still worry about someone imposing on them. And so I think if you're uh, a friend or a family member thinking about the specific ways in which you're willing or open to help someone and then being very concrete about it can be so helpful because first of all, then you're making sure that you're not overextending yourself because uh, you might have your own finite time and resources um, to, um, that, that you can and can't help and, or invest in someone. And then also it lets them know when it's really okay to contact because if someone says, um, you know, we've had times where there were pretty serious uh, medical problems in the family and people will, with the best of intentions, say, you know, reach out to me if you need anything because, I knew, for example, my child is very sick. And that's a lovely thought, but I, like, what is anything? You know, is anything, is it an email? Is it a text? Is it, you know, is a 30-minute phone conversation? Would that be, you know, does anything cut off at 20 minutes? And so I think being really specific about, about that can help someone feel a lot more comfortable um, contacting you. And uh, hopefully it'll also help you uh, as well. And I guess the more general uh, concept would just be, I, I think as Bridget also, uh, and Lisa already addressed a little bit, um, trying to find underlying causes. So medical causes is, is mentioned, uh, whether there's trauma or someone's feeling unsafe or you know, kind of what might be a, a better long-term support for the person um, because Maybe they're really stressed at their workplace and you can help them uh, get support there. Or maybe there's a medical cause that's maintained, or maybe they have something that, you know, setting them up with a one on one therapist would be more helpful for. So 
I know those kind of analyses uh, can be difficult to do like on, on, the, on the spot, but to the extent that you're familiar with the person that you feel comfortable asking them, um, I think that can be helpful if someone seems like they're struggling. So. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, I was wondering, do you all do you also you do you have any suggestions on what can be done for early prevention? Um, I think I saw Lisa put in the chat that it's it's good to go ahead and and talk to someone um, because it's not going to put the idea into their head if you think that there's an issue, but. What about ahead of time, like far in advance? If it's not going to put the idea into their head, what can we do to try to, you know, be a little preventative? You know, what do you, What do you think would work from your perspective? Um, I think Lisa highlighted it uh, with the statement uh, that removing masking. Uh, oh, I I don't want to ruin that quote because it's really good. The one you had on your slide. I don't know if you want to chime in, Lisa. The exact wording of it it was really good but it also reminds me of the comment in the trans community of like gender affirming care um gender affirming treatment is suicide prevention uh lisa do you have the quote yeah yeah understanding autism and the culture of autistic people so they don't have to mask or camouflage their autism is suicide prevention yeah, I didn't want to butcher that quote because like, boom, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, but it, it's true. So part of that is accepting the stims, um, accepting the sensory supports, the needs, um, normalizing uh, these conversations. You can role model it uh, in the household. I, I love to narrate like I was one of those kids that grew up watching like the nature documentaries, so it's totally normal for me to be in a group of people and be like, I am really overwhelmed right now. I'm going to go sit in a corner and look at dog videos on my phone um, and just making your world or your perspective uh, a little more accepting and welcoming of who this autistic person is. Um, yeah, maybe some quirks uh, might be like, why do they do that? But the echolalia, the self-soothing, um, what makes them happy? Uh, not saying, oh, only children collect stuffed animals. Like, yo, squishmallows are cool. I got into it. Like, I understand, like, why it's awesome. Uh, let them be a Disney adult. The my bio that was used was like from years ago, which is kind of great because I'm, I have my own nonprofit circus. I'm a professional mermaid. I am the Monarch International Ambassador. Like the world can be so much brighter and better than we ever imagined. Uh, and especially if you're autistic, uh, kind of like as Sam was talking about, like there's some cool things that go along with like hyper-focusing on random niche interests. Uh, you can make a career out of it. You can have fun with it. You can meet people. You can fall in love, uh, find hobbies that promote physicality. But I never would have gotten to where I was if I didn't have uh, parents and friends and community people who supported me and my special interests uh who was like yeah you can sit down like all the time let's take it slower because of my physical conditions that weren't diagnosed when i was a kid um yeah like the first steps to preventing suicide in autistic people is accepting them uh and figuring out what ways to support them and empower them uh to like understand that full body autonomy, whether it's their personal life, uh, their social needs, employment, um, there's a lot that we can do. And you know what, by attending this webinar and being connected to your local autism society, you're already doing the first steps, which is amazing. Uh, so remember that you being here and watching this, you're already on the road so <laughs> yay first steps yeah. that's awesome Bridget and, and I actually totally relate to that because you know as an autistic parent I'm like okay how do I make sure that I am 
you know, teaching my son how to express his emotions correctly. How do I make sure that he knows that mental health is important? And so, you know, with my divorce and separation, I realized, you know what, you know, let's, let's have him start therapy now. And it just becomes like a normal part of life because he's got transitions from moving across the country. He's got, you know, his parents getting divorced, you know, and, and all of the stuff that goes along with that, like, why should I wait until he's in crisis? I want him to know that this is just as important as his physical health. And I also, there's going to be a total like run on Mercari and eBay now, but I I rediscovered some books that I read as a child. It's the Sweet Pickles series. And it it's like, you know, an like uh, accusing alligator, bashful bear, you know, clever camel, you know, it's, it runs through the alphabet of all these animals that live together in the town of sweet pickles. And it touches on different emotions and different ways to appropriate ways to react in different situations and inappropriate ways to react in situations. And it's just a good model for, you know, even though, yes, it's old, they, they talk in telephone booths, not on cell phones, um, but <laughs> they... You know, it's it's a really great way for us to be able to have dialogue about emotions and how you're and like, oh, how do you think Moody Moose felt when when Nasty Nightingale said that to him? You know, and getting that dialogue going now at a young age, I'm hoping that he knows that it's there are safe people in his life to talk to when he's upset if he doesn't feel like talking to mommy or daddy and it helps him recognize you know what it's not okay when the kid does something mean to me i need to tell somebody about it you know so great sam did you want to chime in yeah uh, it's sort of related to what you mentioned actually because i was also thinking of teaching children um i guess in the context of if you're a parent teaching them that it's okay for them to have boundaries and that it's okay for them to advocate for themselves. I think, you know, so often, especially, you know, when I was growing up, um, I there's a lot of pressure to fit in. And sometimes that just meant doing whatever other people expect. Um, and that can, I think, lead people to feel like we need to always uh, defer to the other person or defer to social expectations. Um, but if something is just different and it's not harmful, I figure why not just embrace that? Um, and especially since autistic people are so often uh, often experience trauma, I think it's really especially important for autistic children to be to be taught like this is what a healthy relationship looks like. This is what uh, isn't healthy. This is what you can do if you don't feel safe or if you don't feel well in a relationship. Here's how you can stand up for yourself or where you can go for support. Um, and I wish like there'd also be more done just to help teach kids all over, autistic or non-autistic, what neurodiversity is so that they can be more understanding and so they can benefit as well. I think it's mutually beneficial for everyone to have friends with different ways of seeing the world. And hopefully that would also prevent bullying if we could bring that to school. Um, so I guess that's kind of initial. I, I'm struck, you guys, all of you, if, if I could just by how self-aware you are. Um, and I'm sure that was a journey, but I just, I wrote it down here on a, my pad, but the, the level of self-awareness um, uh, is just, I mean, for any, for any, any of us, um, but, but uh, you all know, you know yourselves and that seems to, um, in addition to the support that you've, you've had in your lives, but just knowing yourself. Well and I'm glad you brought that up, Melissa, because one thing I'll definitely say is extraordinarily important is if your child is autistic, tell them they are autistic as a moment you know, from because I went for years not understanding why I was the way I was, why I was different, why I felt like I had some I had a psychiatrist diagnose me as schizophrenic because I told her I thought I was different from everybody else. And so she thought I was delusional. And like that was as traumatic as anything else having and not that you know there aren't some lovely people out there that have that diagnosis but you know that the a lot a lot of baggage comes with that of course and 
a loss of medication that nearly put me in a coma as well. Uh, so we want to make sure that the children know that because then it, it normalizes it. I mean, I had a, a funny ex experience with a, a kid I know that, that is autistic and, and I, they were, you know, using their finger to get all the chocolate out of the ice cream bowl at the end. And I said, Oh, I love chocolate so much. I do, I do, or, or, or oh my gosh, I've done, I do that too. I love it. I, you know, got to get to every last drop. And they're like, and, I'm, and I said, Oh, we have so much in common. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause we're both autistic. And I'm like, no, cause we both love chocolate, you know? So it was like a total, like normal thing for them to have it be part of conversation and not something to be afraid of. And, and it, and it gives you a framework to help discuss issues that they may have like oh okay so people who are not autistic are generally going to interpret that conversation this way whereas you interpreted it that way so until the whole world understands autism the way we do you we you know we need to 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 remember that sometimes you know the neurotypicals have to catch up with us um and so <laughs> But, you know, it, being able to frame it that way and speak to it that way, you know, never just say just because, always give a reason, you know, helps them to find themselves in the world, helps to find themselves in life and society and, and gives them the the curiosity to look up the why, to find out the because and and not feel so lost and alone in the world. And also, you know, having friendships with other folks on the spectrum is huge. Um, I have a ongoing text chat with some coworkers who are autistic or OCD and ADHD and, you know, the, that neurodivergent community, we, you know, we're able to talk about anything with each other. Like, you know, conversation can go from, you know, vacation to GI issues in the drop of a hat and we don't care. <laughs> so, um, so I, I do want to give us a few minutes for, for questions, Melissa, if we've had any come in. Yes, I'm looking back here. Uh, let's see. All right. Um, Alan has shared, uh, one of the things about autism is that they have very good memories, which could explain the ruminating being more common among autistics. More of a comment. Um, oh, and I do see there was something about finding healthcare workers that are trained to deal with autistic workers. people. Alan, that yeah, is, I I always you know challenge. when it comes to psychological resources or things like that, I always recommend checking with your local autism society affiliate first. But then also there are Facebook groups for you know you know, for local communities, for parents of kids with quote unquote special needs. Unfortunately, that's how they're all named right now. Um, you know, sometimes they get creative with something else, but those groups oftentimes are really good for referrals as well. Um, when it comes to diagnosis, the same, um, or for females or uh, non-gender conforming, I keep a national list of competent diagnosticians if you're outside of the Howard County area and your local resources don't know. I, uh, um, I'm happy to 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 help, if, or if anybody already knows anybody, let me know. I'll make sure they're on my list. Um, and uh, yeah, because if you're in Philadelphia, it's awesome. You got five or six choices. If you're in New Mexico, you got to drive to Phoenix. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do have uh, um, a provider directory that is um, we're working with. Um, it's a Pathfinders for Autism directory. There are some there. We have a list. What I find, however, for everybody, um, if you're if you're um, trying to get a provider who is familiar with autism, there's often a long wait, and that's a challenge in, in getting more people um, trained and getting more providers experience. Any kind of doctor, really, but. Um, I do just want to add from my experience of finding a therapist. Um, yep. I specifically sought out one who was trauma informed ah, um, because I'm aware of how much my trauma impacts some of my autism symptoms and characteristics. And we joke a lot that in the Venn diagram of is this symptom or characteristic from autism or trauma, sometimes it's just a circle. Um, and so my advice to anyone who 
is uh, maybe not in an area where people are like can easily say that they're autism certified, they have experience with autism, even if they do have experience, I highly recommend uh, that they also be knowledgeable about trauma because how trauma affects our bodies too with polyvagal, which is fight, flight, freeze, which is one of my special interests to talk about, um, our bodies and how we store pro process uh, the trauma, as I think Alan mentioned, like we can cycle through it anxiety loops are a thing which then also connects into uh the depression spirals and some of the other symptoms that lisa was talking about again through trauma and the trauma that we experience that other people maybe don't experience as strongly whether it's social emotional sensory all that stuff so finding providers that have experience with trauma um has also been beneficial for some of my uh peers in more rural areas who uh also have military bases nearby um so like think that if you're in an area too um uh th there are options out there for trauma informed providers too which sometimes help uh us because we do process trauma differently which that affects this whole spiral, but it is mm -hmm. difficult. And hopefully we'll be working to educate more caregivers and providers so that we're all kind of on the same up-to-date page of what are symptoms, diagnostic criteria, um, we're working there, we're doing it. It's just that's taking a, a while. That's a, that's a really good point. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, Sam has some um, uh, directory for the Durham rally area. Um, Bridget's got some in Maine. Um, I'm sure some of those do virtual. So if that would be something, uh, it's, it really doesn't matter um, if, if you're able to, um, if that would be something that would work for somebody. So we will take those lists. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we do have a question. Um, are there unique signs of suicidal tendencies for young children with autism? Or would they be the same? We don't have research on that, unfortunately. Okay. okay. So it would be difficult to say. Yeah, I, I'm just even thinking back to my own experiences. The big things that uh, stick out to me were also on Lisa's list of difficulty explaining the emotional state, like not having the language for mm -hmm. it. And again and can't emphasize this enough the sudden changes to the behavioral patterns like the sudden change to withdrawal like something that's outside especially like autistic people we like routines if we're able to like have one especially like autistic kids like there's patterns behaviors it's self-soothing and if something is automatically like different um avoidance of certain things um uh, lack of uh like adls hygiene stuff like that like i i felt like those were the big ones um for like youth uh just because yeah there's not that much research on it yet like which is in some ways good because there's not a huge case study but it's also really hard because we know that kids are being affected i was being affected yeah. um well I think the closest we have to quote unquote research is really just reviewing newspaper articles about yet another autistic child that committed suicide at a ridiculously young age. But I will say the common thread I've seen in those articles is bullying. So, you know, bullying prevention there's some you know great national resources out there both through the autism society and through um you know some nonprofits that focus on bullying and getting programs into the schools to prevent it getting buddy programs set up in schools so that they're because there's always the helpers that's what they've been described to me as is the the little kids who like as soon as the autistic kid get shows up at school grabs their hand and said says hey i'm so 
happy to see you today. Today we are celebrating Billy's birthday and see, look, he brought treats for us. So later on, we're going to have treats like because they intuitively know even like in preschool age that that the autistic kid's going to want to know if something different from the routine is going to happen today. And you don't half the time you don't even have to teach those kids but find them have a formal pro you know buddy program to help you know have that helper be with them during the social times of the day it can be also huge for bullying prevention because the bully is more likely to target a kid who's alone thank you but also, also like take the bullying seriously like if the school mm -hmm. won't go the police like i'm just mm -hmm. you could not pay me enough to be a kid in these days with cell phones uh like i was part of the generation that had to print out the chat logs and stuff and you'd see them in like the trash can in high school kids these days no bullying like seriously have a zero tolerance for it um that's all i gotta say as someone who's experienced it like mm -hmm. oof. yeah i'm before chat logs so i get it <laughs> anecdotally something noticing autistic children I know who are going through a rough time with mental health is um, sleep problems. I imagine that probably applies to adults as well. It's unique, but, um, and also just fear of going to school or fear of certain places, which often probably is related to bullying or other problems there. But one thing that I think can be useful about these indicators is that even if someone doesn't currently have access to a reliable method of communication, like you can still observe their changes in sleep, and kind of use it as a proxy for well-being. Yeah. Um, we have a yeah. comment. Uh, my son is 13 and has had and has had to mask his true feelings every time he's been in public school just holding all his frustrations in, all the sensory triggers in since he was in kindergarten. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm wondering too about, I also jotted down adolescence because that does seem to be when we get a phone call at the office, um, a child, you know, a young person having some challenges and a, maybe a family member looking for resources tends to be more around adolescence, um, you know, mid-teens, early adulthood. I'm just thinking hormones and just, again, the sensory um, impact of what's going on in your body and your brain. It's um, also, you have to remember too, uh, in the high school, like around the teenager time, Yes, we definitely need more research on the effect of hormones on autistic bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, for parents who have like kiddos and stuff, I always kind of joke of like, yeah, you figure out the sensory, everything like, fortunately, like the wheel gets reset at puberty, uh, as everyone kind of knows, like everything you thought you knew of the sensory out the window, um, which is difficult, but also that's when the social dynamic and the social pressure uh of looking a certain way uh of having the perfect communication style which y'all are teenagers like we didn't know how to communicate well people are like in their 40s and still don't know how to communicate well um but there's like a huge amount of pressure right around that time and a lot of talk to of the future uh are you going to college jobs like that's when schools like parents, other like adults kind of start with some of the subconscious pressure of like, think of the future when you might have someone who's struggling just to make it through the day uh, because of the masking. Like masking is exhausting, uh, especially like raised female, if you're non-binary, uh, even like if you are a cis, male like assigned and raised as a male you're told to be like brainy and smart and buff and strong like you can't be everything at once and it's really distressing uh but teenagers are still often shrugged off as oh these are just teen problems yeah but right then that's all they know they don't know about mortgages and taxes and like 
payroll and stuff like that's their entire world i have no idea looking back what stressed me out as much as it like did keeping me up at three in the morning panic attacks everything in school but i know at the time it felt like life or death and Mm -hmm. I don't, I believe that is more exacerbated than our neurotypical peers. Being autistic, we are told so often how autistic people should treat others. We are not told enough how we as autistic people should be treated. I made friends with people who took advantage of me. Um, And then I was left to feel bad not understanding these emotions, not understanding what friendship means in that teenage years, especially because friendships do change. Like there's pressure, drugs, sex, rock and roll, whatever. Um, It's difficult to be a teenager. And it was difficult back in like the early 2000s for me. Um, Again, you cannot pay me enough to be a teenager these days. So like, not just listen, but as lisa said ask the direct questions don't ask how their day was uh ask hey that test that you had today how do you feel about that or pay attention to the social dynamics it may not make sense to you at all you might need a flow chart like write down the names like who's connected to who but like if rebecca is suddenly not talking to rachel um and they're not sitting together at lunch and now you have no one to sit with lunch sit out with lunch that's a huge social thing like how are they navigating that and again teenagers these days like i'm very thankful that i was raised on like the 90s like social dynamic and stuff where everyone just broke into a dance number halfway through the movie like (laughs) very different than today's culture with cell phones and Instagram. Can't do that. And also something, something else to remember, Bridget just kind of touched on a little bit um, about making sure what, you know, what's going on. There was a real life um, experience this young kid had back to the young kids for, for a minute. And he was in crisis because he was being bullied and People were knocking him, kids were knocking him down, taking the ball away, he giving him back the ball and then knocking him down again. And, you know, he was in crisis over this until finally somebody figured out what was happening. They were playing football and he just did not understand what was happening. And so he was, you know, in crisis about about a, a game that was being played that he perceived very differently than everybody else. I have a short thought related to what Bridget mentioned about masking. Um, I guess this is maybe more geared towards clinicians, but maybe it could apply to parents or teachers as well. Is it sometimes proactively inviting someone to sort of metaphorically unmask or be themselves can be really helpful? I know for myself, I saw a therapist who is very kind and is completely fine with me rocking back and forth all the time, as I tend to always do. But I didn't know that going in, and I just kind of assumed that, you know, as with most places in life that people might not accept it. And so I think it, it might not be possible to proactively address every single thing that could come up, but just if you're a clinician making it clear that people are welcome to move around, or to, to write, to communicate if that's more comfortable, to let you know if the sensory environment is too loud or too, uh, too hot or too cold or what, whatnot. Or, you know, if you're a parent letting your child know that if they want to change something about how they communicate, that you're open to discussing that with them. I think just letting people know that it's okay to ask can be, really helpful, especially uh, for someone who's maybe hesitant to, uh, to be to be viewed as a typical. Thank you for that. That's wonderful. Um, we are at 830. Do you all have any last thoughts that you'd like to share? Um, we do have some very uh, appreciative comments in the chat um, about sharing this recording with other colleagues and uh, appreciating the information and resources. So thank you all for being with us tonight and sh- and and talking about this, um, anything, any last thoughts before we we say good night? Uh, I think the last thing I'll just say is support uh, your autistic 
person and their special interests because they too can grow up and join the circus and be a mermaid <laughs> or a fairy or anything they want to do. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and I'll, I'll just say that remember another part of Lisa's quote that we are a culture. You know, so think of us as a, a separate culture. So the same way that you would accommodate and, um, you know, we no longer ask everyone to assimilate to our, our um, majority culture, you know, think of it that way, because you, you get a bunch of autistics in a room, regardless of their level of communication needs, and, and it's magic. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and I also want to acknowledge Beth Benavides, who is um, on the National Autism Society Board, who brought um, this topic to our attention and connected us with, with Carly and all of you. So thank you to Beth. Um, and uh, thank you guys all for being here. And thank you who joined us. We'll be posting the recording very soon and the support materials on our website.